Guest has been in the film industry most of his life. He has acted alongside film giants like Steven Spielberg, Robin Williams, Mickey Rooney, and that's just to name a few. He's voice acted some of your favorite shows like Avatar The Last Airbender, American Dragon, Jake Long, and has been crazy enough to throw fire at me through a Chicago land Barnes & Noble. Please welcome the very awesome Dante Bosco. How are you, sir? Very good. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think it only figures to talk about your most popular character we all know you played him when you were very young. Begins with an R, ends in an O. Let's get to it. When you played Romeo in Michael Jackson's uh, yeah, Moonwalker, exactly. awesome. <laughs> uh, everyone knew you were going to be a huge. It was just going to be this huge part, so memorable that most people don't even remember the name of that character. But on INDB, even though everyone just thought you were a dancer, you officially have a name in Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, and it's Romeo. Tell us about how that part just laid way for this incredible... Awesome. Yeah, Life. no, nothing, nothing. Yeah, I'm actually just a dancer in that video. I don't you know. You are more than a dancer. I am. You are Romeo. Exactly. It says so much about you. I don't know how IMDb works, but certain things get on there that have no, have to have the incorrectness, but it, you can never get them off either. But but it, it is defined a generation. Despite you think you were just a dancer, I we all see you as Romeo, so. Thank you. Thank whatever. you. It, it certainly left a big impact on my life and many others. Well, I'm glad. With that said, um, you got into acting very, very young. Uh, you started acting when you were, what, 10 years old, I believe? Uh, 10, yes. Yeah, did it, was it easy to sort of warm up to the Hollywood scene? Because, I mean, you went right into movies, music videos and stuff. Yeah, I mean, be adjustment? before, we're, I'm originally from, uh, me and my family are from the Bay Area, a little town outside of San Francisco, and um, we were break dancers in the 80s. So, before we got to L.A., uh, we were we were dancing, so literally we were dancing every weekend. My mom did our stats one time before we got to LA. We uh, we won 34 uh, break dancing contests. Wow. We got picked up by the San Francisco Ballet Company, did the Nutcracker. We danced for. Wait, 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 wait. Break dancing Nutcracker? Oh, no, it was actually. They, 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 in the 80s, they were short on boys, so they had to find uh, dancers to kind of to become ballet dancers. So it was really Billy Elliot. That film is like really emotional to me because it really reminds me of my life story. If Billy Elliot was about breakdancing and yeah. ballet, that would be unbelievable. Right, so like they got breakdancers from the streets and they gave us scholarships to learn ballet. No kidding. Yeah, so we did that. Me and my brothers did that. And then we danced. We were dancers for the 49ers, for the Oakland A's, uh, for the USFL team at the time, the Oakland Invaders. And we did all that before we got to L.A. when I was the age of 10. So by the time we got to L.A., we've already you know, had all that kind of experience going on. So, so you were used to working with someone saying, go here, do this, do that. And yeah. Just salute, I, say yes, sir. I guess we were like professional dancers before we got to L.A. become professional actors. That now, kind of thing. Now, what made you want to transfer into acting then uh, from dancing? Uh, it, it seemed, pr I mean, we didn't know we were going to. It's like we came to L.A. as dancers. Um, but when you get to L.A., you quickly realize like, you know, it's, it's, an, and it's an actor's world. As far as act, it's a filmmaking, it's movies and television, and so we we briskly got into acting. I think our first dance agent was like, "Well, we you should go out and auditions for film and television and commercials also." And we're like, "Okay," and <laughs> just saying that, my parents got us into my mother got us to an acting class, and uh, and I think I booked my first audition, so it just kind of went from there. Viral from there. Uh, going off of. The first question there, what is it like being the lost boy everyone can agree on? Because everybody loves Rufio. Yeah, Rufio. Nobody dislikes Rufio. It's amazing. Yeah, Rufio, I, you know, it's one of those characters. I, I don't have words. It's like one of those weird things. It's like everyone comes to Hollywood to hopefully do some kind of character sometime that you'll be remembered for. You know, that kind of thing. And for a generation uh, that grew up in the 90s, when Rufio was there and it just was an impactful character for a lot of people so and for me too I mean if I wasn't if I didn't play the character I'd still be a fan of the character because he was just <laughs> cool you know very cool kind of anti-hero gets killed uh just kind of been you know I just feel kind of fortunate to be that's that's part of my resume something you were talking about I never noticed uh is that you were saying Rufio was very much uh, a child of the 80s and a lot of people had criticisms of that, but you pointed out that that was part of Spielberg's plan 
because all the kids were from different time periods yeah. over time, like some from the 50s, some from the 60s, and so yeah. on and so forth. Um, is So did they have Mascara in Neverland? Did he bring that from I have the no 80s? Idea. How did that work? I have no idea. You know, it's like the whole thing, it's, it's like it's cool now. Like you look at Rufio, it's cool now. But when we first booked the role, there was no image for what it's going to be. I just so many sketchings that they had. There was a sketching of me with dreadlocks. I mean, there was a part of bangerang is a, like a uh, like a Jamaican word, so there was the original idea for me to be like very Jamaican-ish. Uh, and then, you know, you play so many different cultures and stuff. You haven't actually done Jamaican yet. I haven't done Jamaican yet. Um, but then, you know, when we did that particular outfit, and Steven Spielberg was like, "Yes, that's, that's the look." And when you're young, you're like, "This is really the look. This is it. I'm wearing a Michael Jackson jacket and a." And a, and a midriff shirt, like, wow, this is not how I'm going to be in this big movie. <laughs> uh, now looking back, you're like, it's cool. And then, of course, yeah, the, the whole thing with the mascara when he's doing the fight scene, like, you know, I don't know if it's the makeup or Steven, they're like, you know, let's try this. And, you know, you're a kid on the set going, is that this is what we're going to do? I'm going to wear this weird makeup? And then it becomes, like, classic for the time, so... It's definitely, it's definitely very iconic. There's only one Rufio. Yeah. You know, and one only Rufio. one look. Everybody got it. He apparently never changes his clothes. So I don't know how he smells. He doesn't but still. change his clothes. But he has to get up every morning and do the moose and the hair. So. Which is crazy because every Halloween you always get pictures of cosplayers. Uh, like people getting dressed up as Rufio. And then would Twitter now and Tumblr, you know, people write you that name their animals Rufio <laughs> and their sons Rufio. Which is crazy. Wow. And it's cool. You're like, that's a cool name. I'm glad that you named your child after uh, <laughs> my character. Great. Would they call him Roof for short? Sure? Roofy? I don't know. Roofy. Hey, Roofy. Roofy. Come here, Roofy. Come on. And then I, I, He's not going to get many dates. No. And then I recently wrote a blog, actually like last week, about uh, how you know you're part of pop culture is when people start tattooing you on their body. <laughs> really? So there's a lot of Rufio tattoos so my 15 year old face adorns <laughs> the body of several uh guys and girls just you know and it's kind of flattering it's like I, it's one of those things like how do you feel about that it's like i don't i get it i mean i get it it means something to you it means something to the whole generation so if people know who it is they totally understand what you're about you're like a lost boy lost girl i get it like bangerang is a very you know it's a whole thing so it's just interesting when it's your 15-year-old face <laughs> on someone else's arm or leg or back or something. Um, is there any truth that Steven Spielberg is so nice as a director that you immediately want to go punch someone just to sort of offset it? Uh, he is nice, but um, he was, he's very nice, but he's also, my memory of him, he's a very strong director. You know, especially with kids, he would very, uh, he would get the moments he wants to get somehow, you know. With me and him, he he would always, his big, it's so ironic, it's like so funny, because like he would always stop me, because I was always a young actor, and I guess I was imitating my heroes, right? So Marlon Brando is one of them, and he'd always be like, cut, you're, stop imitating Brando, go back, <laughs> and, you know, do it again, which is hilarious, but he definitely... As nice as he was as a person and, and lovely, uh, he ought, was also very, not hard on the actors, but he was very stern about getting the performance he wanted to get, especially from a lot of the kid actors. So my memory was he's a very strong director. Well, you have to be. I mean, just looking at that set, yeah. any of those sets, I mean, it's huge, and, and there's so many people on there. Uh, and yet I hear he's always, like you said, so kind with kids, yes. especially he's so good with kids. Yeah, yeah. He's just an, he's kind of another... Um, generation of directors and he does a certain thing that not a lot of directors can do he's he's an epic director epic you know it's like doing hook of course all these epic sets and all this an epic storyline but even seeing war horse the way he directed certain moments and you're you're seeing a grand director it's like not all directors can be a be a conductor for a symphony that big it's he just, made that horse act very yeah, good. Yeah, he has The way like, he said his lines and no, the way the eyes look. Yeah. I mean, it's like he understands. No, there's like a horses. bravery you have to have to go, I mean, this is the shot. It's going to be the super wide shot of the field and a horse and let the horse <laughs> just stand there. I mean, there's certain things that it's, 
not every director has the brave the the guts to go to direct in this way and know how epic something can be. You know, because it's like well, let me just go in for a close up and and then and, and manipulate something like this. So it's just a different kind of directing that I don't think a lot of people it, it can do, or even a studio would give them the ability to go. Here's hundreds of millions of dollars. I want you to do this story that everyone knows or something and make something grand happen. You know, it's, that doesn't happen that yeah. often. Well, he's proven himself so many times. Totally, too. Yeah. totally. So, um, it, you were born with this very, very young sounding voice and this has transitioned into voice acting work. Right. And, and you've done uh, everything from young men to teenagers to young boys. Uh, is it a strange transition, or do you seem to pick it up pretty easily? I don't even know. You know, it's, I don't, I don't, you know, you don't really hear your own voice when you talk, I don't think. So I'm always kind of surprised when I hear it back later on, uh, especially doing voice acting. Yeah, I don't know how my voice, this is, I don't know. So like someone asked me on television something about, they were just saying, you sound the same, you know, like Hook, that's like all of a sudden, they're watching Hook and they, 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 they hear Prince Zuko, right, the whole time. And I go, is it possible that my voice hasn't changed since I was 15? Is that even remotely possible? And like fans are like, yes, it is. <laughs> Which I'm like, I don't know how that, that's crazy. I don't know, I don't know how that happens. I really don't really focus a lot on the voice. I mean, if it's maybe a younger character, I'll think younger to a certain degree. But uh, I'm just trying to act. And then whether there's a camera in the room or a microphone in the room, I'm just, I'm just trying to act. You know? Is is there any point where you have to say a line or a phrase where you're like, really, that's what the kids are saying? Okay, or a line you don't understand is just sort of uh, new slang or yeah. something? Yeah, I mean, certain things like with, with a, when we did Jake Long, The American Dragon, we improv a lot of those lines, me and the other actress, Kitty. Uh, and But, you know, it's like a hip-hop kind of show, and I'm, I'm like very much of the hip-hop generation, so... I was probably using slang like that was from our, my from my generation <laughs> more than their generation, the kids at that time, but we had a good time doing that stuff. Now, you know, I try to stick to the script as much as possible. <laughs> um, when you played Zuko on Avatar, just tell me about that whole experience because that character in that show to me is amazing. I don't even know where to begin with it. Yeah. What, just tell me about that whole experience about the fan, just everything connected okay. to that show. What's your take on well, it? Well, the beginning of it is uh, they call me into um, to Nickelodeon to go meet these producers for the show, right? They could give you the script and the character, it's like Zuko. And of course, my first thought of Zuko is Danny Zuko in the... Uh, <laughs> You know, they're very like, similar. I'm yeah, sure. I and mean, I was like, ah, oh, like Danny Zuko, it's so funny. And they're like laughing when I met Mike and Brian the first time. And I'm reading through the script, and I'm like, this is obviously some epic Asian-inspired martial arts uh, series for Nickelodeon. And in my mind, I really didn't even think it was going to go. I was like, this is not going to happen. I... I, I... It's. I think everyone is still amazed at Nickelodeon. It's amazing show like that because they haven't done any of our shows like that no. apart from Cora. When you walk in there, when I walked into Nickelodeon that day, I literally was reading this Asian Spire situation, and you're looking at statues of SpongeBob SquarePants <laughs> and uh, big portraits of Cat Dog. Remember Cat Dog? Oh yeah. So Cat Dog and like the buildings all white at that time. It has like green slime on top. I mean, that, it's Nickelodeon, and I'm like, this isn't Nickelodeon. This is. Something else. This is not Nickelodeon. Um, and I just thought, you know, at face value, I thought it was just going to be the bad guy on the show. And I was like, all right, cool. I'm the bad guy who's chasing the uh, the good guy around. All right. And we did the pilot episode, and it kind of got picked up, and we started running. And I didn't really think much about it, the first kind of season of it. I just thought I was this bad guy. Cool. I didn't see some of the artwork. Um, during the second season, when it started... Well, I don't know how it breaks down as far as when it was coming up, but the second season we start seeing the character being more, you know, you, the, after the scene with the father where he gets scarred, and I start, you start to really see the character pro progression and the character arc of the story. You start, I start like really kind of falling in love, like, oh my god, what's going on? Like this is crazy. This guy's even more than what I expected or what anyone expected. And me and the other cast, Jack Senna and Mae Whitman, we'd come in like, did you read what happened this week in the script? Like that kind of stuff started happening for us as we were doing it. So um, I didn't know even how big it was until it was going on. I was doing the movie Take the Lead in Toronto, 
uh, with Antonio Banderas, and we're like, and I'm leaving the set every week to uh, to shoot episodes, to record episodes while I was in Toronto. And I remember one time I'm leaving the set, and one of the actors, Brandon Andrews, who's like the bigger guy in the, in the movie, and he's like, where are you going? I'm like, oh, I'm doing a cartoon. I got to run out and do a cartoon for a few hours. He goes, a cartoon? What cartoon? What are you, what are you doing? And he's, I'm like, oh, it's this show for Nickelodeon called um, Avatar, The Last Airbender. And he was like, flipped out. He was like, what? <laughs> well, that, that's my show. And I, like, seeing it through his eyes in that moment is when I first started seeing the, the popularity of the show. Um, and then from there, you know, just the whole arc, by the time it finished, then we started really seeing how popular the show got. And what's weird is we weren't, we weren't connected as a, uh, because this is before like Twitter kind of blew up, and I don't even think we had Facebooks at that time, so we didn't really understand how popular the show got. Later on, when I did Cora, where everyone's connected, we know how popular that show is and how fast Cora is going to grow. So it's been an amazing, amazing journey in that way. You come into this part, you, you play a teenager, uh, it, but you play it as someone who's pretty much probably double his age. Do you feel it gives you an advantage on the character, knowing more what this character? is going through seeing how you may have gone through it before yeah, or I could see that um I mean yeah of course there's a uh, there's that there's uh, there's a lot of these scenes that that Zuko has played with is playing with his father and his uncle that I've got to play those scenes in real life a eh? because I've been through that age and also I've got to play those scenes in other television and films um every actor they say has a, a certain casting that's their sweet spot you know um, the actors that work a long time, whether they be uh, stars or whatever, they usually play the same characters over and over again. That's like the kind of the big trick in Hollywood that a lot of people, a lot of times you don't really understand. If you watch a Harrison Ford film, if you watch a Tom Cruise film, they're actually playing the same character over and over, yeah. over and over and over again. Um, Unlike as, Jeff Goldblum, who has just been so diversified. Yeah. It's amazing. Which is crazy. Look at me, it's like he just becomes somebody else every time. Right. It's amazing. Which, uh, there's, they say there's, a, someone told me there's, um, the way acting works is that you're either going to play characters closer to yourself or you're going to play characters further than yourself, right? Like the character actor or the leading man actor. The leading man actor is going to play characters closer to yourself, but what, which one's harder or not? We, 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 we seem to think that sometimes it's harder to play a character outside of yourself, but, maybe, but for character actors, it might be harder for them to play a character that's more like themselves, you know? But, um, but the character that I play seems like over and over in my career, at least growing up, I was always the, the kid that was the bad kid turned good and has the heart of gold in the end and somehow is able to redeem himself. And so, for many films, I play this character a lot. And like in a lot of ways, Rufio and Prince Zuko are the same character. Um, and so, yeah, so you're able to play these scenes again and again and maybe fine tune them. <laughs> I don't know. There was one, the director wrote me a note when I did this film, Take the Lead, with Antonio, and I did, and I'm the same kind of character. Was like this badass kid who actually becomes a very cool kid at the end. And she's like, but "You did some things in the film that made Antonio Banderas changes his performance a few times, right?" And I'm like, "Oh, that's cool." I mean, I was like, "Thank you for the compliment," but then at the same time, in my mind, I'm like, "I've played this character so many times. <laughs> if I don't know how to play this character by now, you know, then I don't know what I'm doing." Uh, we're talking about Avatar franchise. Gotta ask the question. Yeah. You seen the movie? No. How no. is that possible? I just didn't. I never saw it. Uh, you know, Mike and Brian told me not to see it. They're like, don't <laughs> they, see it. They came out about it. They said they, they weren't happy when they finally came out about yeah, it. Yeah, they said they weren't happy. Uh, they are like, don't watch it, man. It's not. You know what? There's nothing. I, and there's nothing. I don't have anything against M. Night Shyamalan. I'm actually a fan of, uh, especially his early films. In Sixth Sense is an amazing film. I think Unbroken is my favorite film of his. Uh, <laughs> Unbreakable. Unbreakable. Sorry, Unbreakable. <laughs> Unbreakable is probably my favorite film because I love that twist on the, the superhero film. Uh, that's actually, I'm one of the few people that I, I think we share that because I actually do like that film. I like too. the film. Like, a lot of people don't like it. Yeah, I, I can see why, but like, I, and I'm one of the few that likes the ending as well, like how you like it. Yeah, I like it because it's, it, it's a superhero film that is not, it's very un superhero y. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so I think he's a brilliant director and I just think it's a uh, you know it's a misstep who knows I it's like if I ever audition for M. Night it's like I, he's like I, I read I saw something online where he said something bad uh, <laughs> it's just hard to make a film 
Honestly, it's hard. If it was easy to make a brilliant film, uh, we'd be making more brilliant films as a as a community, you know. But it's hard. Uh, I just think it's a. There's probably some things that they say. I can't, it's hard for me to talk about because I never saw the film. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wish, you know, I wish it kind of did better in that sense. <laughs> did you see it? Oh, I. I think it's like my second most watched review. Really? <laughs> yeah. And it, was it just that bad? It's not it's, bad, but not. you know, it's it's bad, but at the same time, it's in my opinion, it's dead on arrival because you can't do a movie on the first season. You can't do it and satisfy anybody, in my opinion. Right. So it, it's not something. But would have been good if you didn't know the series. Uh no. It, it, it Even bad, bad if you didn't know. That. No, but from what I've heard, there's other thing. Like you said, you were saying it. It, you don't know if it's entirely Shyamalan's problem and also that every film, I always say every film is kind of like a little miracle because right. they are so but difficult totally. and it's so much going into it. Uh, and hearing some of the stories going into it about why they had to make certain casting choices right. and, and why some of the decisions, you know, I, I don't entirely blame Shyamalan, but it's a it's a tough project to try and do anyway and it's kind of, it, right. it's kind of destined for failure. It's pretty hard. I think, you know, I wish they would have used Mike and Brian's input more because mm-hmm. those guys hold the Bible to the story, you know? Um, and my biggest, not qualm with the film, but the thing, I wrote a, I wrote a blog when it was coming out because so many people were asking me questions. I found it was like, I don't know, at 2 a.m. in the morning, I wrote something. And then it went <laughs> Always viral. Always a good time to write well, something. It probably wasn't the best time to write it because I actually got freaked out the next morning when it kind of went viral. And then all of a sudden, like Nickelodeon's calling me up. Like, what are you writing about? And I'm like, oh, I just, it, I just, I don't know. Too, but my whole thing was basically... And, you know, Mike and Brian agree with me, well, it's just on the casting, right? So, uh, and not even about uh, me playing Prince Zuko, which would have been great. Um, and I'm actually a fan of Dev Patel, so and I, I'm sure he did a fine job. He's a fine actor. But just of, with the Aang character, um, being an ethnic actor in L.A. and growing up and getting my career launched by being in a movie like Hook, right? There's not a lot of roles for, say, like a young Asian actor. Um, and... The fact that you weren't able to cast one in this particular film was a missed opportunity for a launching someone's career. And nothing against a kid who played Aang. It's just that there's other roles for Caucasian kids that come out a lot, you know, more often than uh, something this kind of big to really kind of shed light on. Maybe give give the chance for a new kid to kind of a springboard for his career. We don't know if it could have been the next, you know, the first Asian Will Smith for Hollywood or something like that. And I just thought it was a missed opportunity because I know the power of what the Hollywood mach- machine is if you can kind of give a young kid a shot in that way. And there's not going to be, there's not a lot of chances for young Asian roles like that. that but, happen. But, but let's be honest, the film did so poorly anyway. Maybe, they yeah. probably saved right, a career. Right, right, right. right, right. You know, maybe they was going to try out and then he went and did something else and that was a big hit or something. This is so. true. We don't know that either. <laughs> I just wrote that during the time so that just, I just came in from that point of view, you know. But, uh, yeah, it's just so weird. They're like, well, we didn't want to cast this but we wanted to we wanted to pronounce the names correctly. But <laughs> that was the big that was the first telltale sign for me. They couldn't get the names right. They're like, well, it's not Aang, it's Ong. And we're like, What? <laughs> it's like doing uh when we do, you know, Star Wars and be like, No, it's Loke Skywalker. <laughs> like, well, how does that work? If there was a Loki Skywalker, if that's in the new Star oh, Wars, that would be amazing. A Loki cool. Skywalker. Loki Skywalker. He, he has like the big horns and yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. The, the long blonde hair turns into the horns. Let's make this that happen. That could be cool. J.J. Abrams is watching. Let's make that I'm happen. excited. I'm, I'm a fan. I've always been a big fan of Star Wars, so I'm excited to uh, for the new trilogy to come out. Yeah, no, it should be fun. I'm, I'm curious to see what they're going to do. I'm curious, too. Dante, how old are you? 39. Where is this unicorn blood you are drinking to keep this youthful uh, look? And where can we get it by God? I know. You still look like you're 22 or something. I don't know. It's got to be all that time I spent in Neverland. It's got to be that for sure. I don't know what it is. I guess it's L.A. Very. I think everyone kind of... L.A. is like a Neverland place. So people kind of <laughs> slow down and age over there. No seasons. No seasons. Those are the endless temperate summer kind of thing. Um, and lucky, you know. I tell people, <laughs> just luck. Just luck. I, I always tell people like it's gonna. I'm gonna turn. I'm gonna, overnight. I'm gonna go from the Karate Kid to Mr. Miyagi. Like overnight. <laughs> I'm gonna turn around. All of a sudden, I'm like the old wise man. We'll see when that day comes. Um. 
You are known for acting, obviously, for uh, screen acting and voice acting, but I think that's what most people sort of connect you to, but you do a million other things. You're a producer, you're a writer, you do poetry, you uh, uh, put productions together, you do all sorts of stuff. What is a typical week like for you? Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's crazier than I think, and I forget, I actually vlogged for my first time like a, a month straight, like every day, and it, I was pretty amazed about how much crazy stuff that I do myself. Um, so it's wild. You know, I, I started a poetry venue uh, about 17, 18 years ago in Los Angeles. Um, and it became the largest open mic venue in the country. So I've been very involved in the, the spoken word poetry scene for the last two decades. Uh, so that's always going on. Um, I'm, I have a production company in Hawaii called Kinetic Films that does Asian American Pacific Islander films. And we produced three films so far. And I co-wrote the fourth film that we're getting funding for right now and so we're doing in the midst of that and I wrote a play called Midnight Makeout Session that we're that had a few really good uh, runs that we're going to do a new run of it soon uh, I started a collective uh, downtown called We on the 8th which is an Asian American arts collective about collaborating YouTube artists and digital artists with traditional media folks and really trying to create um, an Asian American genre in America as far as uh, media and the whole concept we came up with is we on the eighth, which is co-opting the eighth of the month for new media, uh, new Asian media every month. So we release new media every month and kind of promote for each other. So I, it's kind of I've been around LA a long time in the industry, and part of being uh, in Hollywood and sticking around so long is keeping yourself uh, creatively active and busy. We can always what what kills me is just kind of sitting around waiting for auditions. Which is always, it's like, that's part of life in L.A. I mean, we're constantly auditioning, whether it be on screen, uh, voice stuff, uh, commercial, anything, everything. That's just how the town works. Um, but I've been around so long that you also want to, you're, you're, you're a tool in other people's story as an actor. Uh, it comes a time where you're, when you're like, oh, I have a few stories that I want to help tell too. Whether it be a story that I write or whether it's a story that I find from someone else. And let's get together and, and create that. And there's no better time than now, digitally, where we can, you know, we all have cameras. All my friends, we all have cameras. We all have lights. Uh, we have time, and let's shoot stuff, and let's collaborate. And so it's a really, really kind of vibrant time in L.A. right now. It's really exciting. You've worked with, as I said before, a lot of screen legends, a lot of huge, huge names. Uh, which one, or, or ones, uh, have left the biggest impact on you? Um, God, I mean, of course, the Hook Days, those guys are all, those, I mean, Spielberg, Hoffman, Williams, they're super big just because it's my teenage days and my kind of really big uh, entrance into Hollywood. You know, um, Antonio Banderas always is great. You know, the big stars that you, you, you work with, you kind of start to understand why they're stars when you talk to them and when you interact with them. They definitely make you feel like special. It's this weird thing. It's kind of like we're well, talking with Antonio. I was telling somebody, you know, you, you know, especially at that time, I always say, yeah, I'm a pretty hip kind of guy and think I got it going on. Then you meet someone like that, walks in the room, like, who's that guy? Right? And then he's talking to you and like everyone else disappears in the room and he's telling, whatever, he's telling you anything. I don't know what he's talking about. And when he leaves the room, he does the big Z, he's like, shoo, shoo, shoo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you're looking at this guy like, this guy has really pretty eyes. You're like, what's going on? <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's the George Clooney effect. Yeah, right? exactly. Suddenly he will suck you in. Exactly. Uh, it's so many, every film has its own thing, you know, and has its own, uh, it leaves its own impact on you. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. I tell folks, uh, a lot of the audience watch Films that we've done, whether they be bigger films or independent films or whatnot, and um, and their experiences through an audience thing, so that's very impactful. But when I look at the films, most of the time it's really like looking at a photo album of of my life, right? So I'm watching Hook, or if I'm watching, but I'm a cheerleader. I'm looking at like, oh my god, I gotta call that person. Like, <laughs> god, remember like that time when we were on that set? It's like looking at that. Even looking at Hook, you're going, God, I gotta call Jimmy Matteo up. He just had a kid. I gotta go hang out with him or Rashawn who played Thud, but like I've been meaning to see one of his magic shows. I gotta go check him out. Your your movies are kind of like everyone else's Facebook. Like, oh yeah, I gotta give him. A yeah, call. Yeah. yeah, I gotta talk. It's to like him. your Facebook, exactly. So, um, so when you're been around town as long as I have, which is coming up on thirty years almost, you you have a lot of different you know photo albums of people that you need to 
every time it comes up, people you need to kind of reconnect with. Um, we lost a great talent uh, yeah. this year. Uh, a lot of us didn't know him personally, but he left a big impact on us regardless. Yeah. And you have worked with him, right. of course. Uh, what are your memories of Robin Williams? Um, you know, A, that he was a very caring and gentle kind of man. It, it was amazing. I mean, I'll forever be, I haven't talked to him in a few years, um, but I'll forever be connected to him because of, of, of Rufio and Peter Pan and that kind of relationship. And my, my first memory is that everything that you want him, that you want Rob Williams to be when you meet him, he delivers in spades, right? He's the one thing he taught me at that age was that when you're the, when you're the lead in the film, when you're, when you're like the number one on the call sheet, meaning like you're the star of the film, um, you, you're responsible somewhat for the morale of the whole uh, set, crew, cast, and everything. And he took that whole cast and crew on his shoulders for months, long days. We, people don't realize how hard it is to make movies. You know, it's fun to watch, but you don't understand that we're working for 14, 16 hour days. Uh, and there's drama and there's madness. And if you, if someone goes into a bad mood or someone's being a diva, it could really spin the whole morale of the set. Like, people don't want to work for people that are jerks, you know? And he's on the set cracking jokes and making sure everyone's having a good time and, and laughing all day long. Um, and that was beautiful to see. And to work with him and really the expertise of him as a brilliant, quick-witted, just master, uh, you, you felt that every day, every scene. Um, and then on, on, the, on the other side, you know, we talked about poetry. I mean, Dead Poets Society was a really big film for me in my life and why I became a poet. And so we would spend a lot of mornings just talking about all the transcendental poets that he loved from that movie, like Thoreau. But also we talked about Charles Bukowski, who's one of my favorite poets, or would talk about Byron, anything. Like in different poetry, he would give me all these ideas. And so I really got to be, spend time with him on that soft spoken side. And, uh, and then, you know, just him as a person. Like when I first met him, one of the things is he was like, what are you? He's like, what's your background? And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm Filipino. And he's like, my wife, my wife's half Filipino. And he's really welcoming me, welcoming you into this world. The thing about it is as, as an actor or as anyone coming into Hollywood, a lot of times we feel we're on the outside looking in. You know, you're like, this is a big party that I, I'm not invited to. Even if you get invited to the party, you just feel like, am I supposed to be at this party? You know what I'm saying? Did the, did the invitation go to the wrong person? And and for someone like a big star to kind of welcome you in and then find places to like, like a little thing like that meant so much to me. Like, you know what? You're a part of this too. This is not outside of you, but you're a part of this thing. Uh, it's a really lovely thing to do and really a beautiful thing to do that, that you don't need to do. And it's very cool. So like, those are my memories and my feelings of him. And for years he, he would always send me Christmas cards. And uh, so I just have beautiful memories of him like that. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, you have worked with Fred Savage twice. Once on Wonder Years, which people have seen, yes. and once on The Wizard. Right. But they can't see you in The Wizard. They can't see me. Where I, are you hiding? I got cut out of that movie. <laughs> a lot of people don't realize, but a lot of actors do a lot of different things that you may get cut out of, and The Wizard was one of them. Uh, I actually played Ben Savage's, be I mean, Fred Savage's best friend in the film uh, from his hometown, and they go, we did all the shooting over the summer. And then end up in, at the final, the final championship game, and I have like so many crazy memories with Fred, and the whole Savage family, and Ben, and all them hanging out for the summer, uh, and Jenny Lewis when we were kids running around Reno. We shot and we we shot and were living in the Bally's Casino in Reno. So I have like a lot of memories of just being a kid running around there bowling, staying up all night. It's weird when you're a kid in a casino because you kind of, you know, you're safe to go around the casino, you know, <laughs> and you have per diem. So, but we end up getting cut out of that film. I end up getting cut out. Me and the other guys that played his best friends. But uh, it's so weird because, uh, a, I remember running into Ben Savage years ago at a, at a club, and he taps me on the shoulder. And he's like, "Do you remember me? Like I'm Fred's <laughs> little brother." And I'm like, "Yeah, dude, Ben. I I know you. What's going on?" Uh, and he, we were talking about the wizard, and just that was just the funnest time. It's great to be a young actor, and these films you do, you just have these like little. Uh, you know, friendships that go on. One of my biggest memories from that is watching, there was an old MTV show me and Fred were watching with the other kids 
called I think it was Remote Control and the girl. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we had like the biggest crush on Kari Wur for some reason. <laughs> awesome. She was hot. And then I remember singing Bobby Brown's Every Little Step with like with Fred Savage and we're dancing around. Like funny things like that. People have their memories of, of like junior high or like elementary school and, and I do too and a lot of my memories just happen to be with kids like Fred Savage or, or something like that because those, those are the years I was in junior high or elementary school so uh, so it was funny shout out to Fred you know the whole <laughs> Savage family <laughs> well he hasn't gone on to anything just directing every always just sunny directing every Philadelphia yeah. episode and yeah being busy he was dog. always brilliant even back then he was like smarter than everybody else he, he seemed like a little mutant alien prodigy. Like, he talked like he was 30 years old. It was unbelievable. Like, no kid talked like how he talked right, in the right, movie. Right. He just seemed like beyond anyone, any kid that age in terms of intelligence. He was. Like. He was definitely. There's A lot of the young actors were really brilliant kids. Charlie Cosmo, who was in Hook, was a brilliant, brilliant kid. Like, super smart. Um, you run to all these kids. I mean, Mayan, Mayan Bialik, when she was on a... She's brilliant. She was on Blossom, and we did the uh, the Earth Day special together. She was brilliant. She I saw her recently before she got on Big Bang Theory, and she was like doing brain surgery or something at UCLA. Actual brain yeah, surgery. Yeah, I'm like you're actually a bra- wow. you're actually a, like a brain doctor. It's like a neurosurgeon. That's what she said. <laughs> and I'm like, what, man? What are you talking about? Like I've just been acting this whole time. <laughs> she was laughing. So there's like the, the lot. I mean, you know, there's a lot of children actors that become drug addicts and kind of mess up but there's a lot of us that actually were smart kids that kind of went on to rocket science or brain surgery i was gonna say you as you said so many child stars have gone to this dark place and haven't gotten out kind of understandably so it's a weird environment yeah and, and you're thrown into something where it's hard to have a normal childhood you seem to have come out of it Okay, well, well, why do you think that is? Well, what do you think was the secret to get yeah, out? Yeah, I think it's good family. All my brothers and sisters are actors and artists and uh, and still in the industry, and so it just becomes less of a of a magical thing and more like this is kind of what we do. Um, but I've you know I've seen a lot of fr- I've been around a long a long time, so I've seen friends I've seen a lot of friends leave the town. I've seen a, a, some friends die, whether it be through uh, drugs or just through the mishaps of, of life and, and, and that kind of lifestyle. Uh, so I just, you know, you just, I think it's really being around good family. And um, now I'm seeing the next generation, my brother, his kids are acting and they're doing well. Uh, my other brother, his like stepson is coming out in a bunch of films and he's about to kind of take off and he's coming out with a new film with, with Bill Murray and seeing it happening again to the next generation, it's kind of like a, a beautiful kind of thing. Um, but at the same token, like you said, like my family's like a really good family to be around, an acting family. So I, I just hope that everyone kind of keeps their feet on the ground and understands like this is the way it is. And I think the kids, they, their feet are on the ground pretty well because they see us, you know, acting all the time. We're all like doing commercials or films and they're visiting the sets. And then if they're around the country shooting, it's like one of us are around there also like, oh, I'm here doing this. So it just feels like not, not that's like not a big deal. You know what I'm saying? It's like, this is what we do. We're an entertainment family. And writing, producing, directing, that's what we do. Music, that's what we do. And it's not anything out of the ordinary. Um, whether What kind of success you get is, is, is uh, you know, hopefully you're fortunate to have bigger success. But it's not like, it's like, not like, wow, the awe. It's not like an awe in it. It's just what we do. I'd like to end every interview with Two polar opposite questions. Okay. Uh, the first one being whether it be professional or personal. What is the toughest thing you've ever had to go through, and how did you get through it? Ah, oh, God, the toughest thing was um, yeah, you know, like I said, everyone has their everyone in Hollywood has their their e true Hollywood story, especially if you've been around any t- period of time. Everyone does, and so of course, I, me, and my my family do. So we had a really dark kind of period where uh, like we didn't talk for like seven years, which is crazy because we're a very tight family. But that, uh, that had to do with a lot of factors in town that, like, that had to deal a lot with acting and business. So getting through that was pretty harsh. But what you know, I think ironically getting through it is getting back to family, which is great. You know? um, 
yeah, it's just it, weird. I know it's kind of vague, but part of it is it's just it's just Hollywood. I mean, a lot of things in Hollywood happen that there's things that happen, especially as kid actors, that ultimately people have to kind of like watch out for as far as who you put your trust in, who you end up following, you know, and there's a lot of different relationships, whether they be acting teachers, managers, you know, and these things can get convoluted and that can also uh, disrupt family life also. So just kind of get back to family and get back to what what home is. You got to find that way. And finally, again, whether professional or personally, what is the proudest thing you've ever done? Um, You know... Recently, it was uh, I produced a docu series where I brought my family home to the Philippines, and uh, it's like this really big kind of thing where, for me, it was this idea. It's like really an American story where a nation of immigrants, and then just go back to where you're from, whether it be Asia, where it be whether it be uh, Africa, or Latin America, or, or Europe, and you kind of really find out. You know, as Americans, we always go, "Where are we really from, though?" and uh, Outside of Native Americans, we're all from somewhere else. So I brought my whole family back, all my four brothers, my sister, my parents. And as artists, we went back to see where we're from. And it's so weird because my grandfather is from a really small village in the Philippines, right? Rice fields. And that's where we ended up still there. We went, his little sister, he's passed away, but his little sister, who's now in her late 80s, still lives there in a hut. And on these rice fields that we have had for hundreds of years... And to bring my family back and for us to go there and realize that in two generations' time, for my grandfather to go from this village to us making movies in Hollywood would be the equivalent of my grandchild walking on the moon or something like that. That's how far the distance is, you know, uh, both economically and physically and just mentally. Uh, it's proud. I'm proud to go, wow, this is what we've done and what we've done as a family and to see where we're going. I'm, like, very proud of my family at this point in my life, so very, very happy in that, in that sense. Wonderful. This has been Dante Bosco on Shut Up and Talk. Thank you and take care. Now, this is where we look at you and we talk. You know, yes. Be like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just going to say stuff. It's like, but now we're going to laugh. <laughs> 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 that thing with the That's seriously, what, what unicorn do you suck the blood? I know. Because I am so insanely jealous. I don't know. I, I'm telling you, I'm going to turn into Mr. Miyagi overnight. All of a sudden. Just overnight, it's going to turn into that. Yeah. I don't believe it. It's you're, gonna you're, you're just going to keep getting younger and younger. It, and when it, you do, I will be there right? to steal your unicorn. And I, I, I was telling someone we got to do a movie with, uh, I got to do a movie with Ralph Macchio because he still looks great. And then we'll see. That's another one who never Ralph ages. Ralph Macchio never ages.